Good morning, ambassadors. Good morning. Guess I'll just have to take what I can get. That's all right. I love you. Yeah. Y'all just having a good time fellowshipping. That's kind of what ambassadors do, amen? So I guess when we get, you know, get to the end of loving on each other and all that, we can talk a little, a little bit about this. We're talking about being ambassadors. And I think, uh, I think Jeff is staying out there at his post for a while because you know I'm going to say something about it. Like I did last time. I don't have the picture of Jeff uh, Watson on the, on the stallion with the guitar and stuff. You know, there's a lot of Jeff Watsons out there. Professional football players and all that kind of stuff. I'm just waiting on him to come in here so I can put him on, on Front Street. But we are ambassadors for Christ, and we've been, uh, we've been reconciled by God. And this is kind of where I wanted to lead into the, the discussion that we had last week. Uh, how, how many people here have been in the military or know somebody in the military? Oh, there you go. All right. Well, and uh, last week I was telling you that, you know, when you join the military and you raise your hand, you say, uh, I will, you know, defend the Constitution of the United States, all enemies, foreign and domestic. At that point, when you raise your hand, you're in the military, right? You in. You got to do something kind of crazy or have an issue to get out. <laughs> yeah. They got the claws in you then, okay? And But I, I pointed out the fact that you don't, you don't expect to go into battle right away. Uh, you expect to have to go through some training. You expect to have to get prepared for it. Uh, I, although I remember one time I was on the battleship in New Jersey, and we were off the coast of Beirut, Lebanon, and we got caught up on the gun line, and folks were shooting at us, and we had to get ready to shoot back. And they were dropping people on the fantail. That's the, bar, the back part of the ship. And there was a gun mount back there. And they were sending people in there that had never been on a ship before in their life. And now they're in this little small room with explosives all around. And they got to figure out what to do. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Uh, we shouldn't be thrown into a, uh, an explosive situation like that as Christians. But we need to prepare ourselves for it. Because people are going to be coming at us if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Now, I mentioned that I was taking a physical for another branch of the service. And they said... Nobody's going to take you with an age. As it turns out, I had this physical uh, anomaly that, that was as a result of when I was in college, I worked on loading docks and did a whole bunch of stuff. So I had a, you know, I had a damaged body. And the Army said, well, we'll take you. But you, no, they said, what you need to do is you need to go out and find a surgeon to fix you up and get you all ready to come in on active duty. But the Navy said, we'll take you like you are. They said, we will we have a medical rehabilitation program and we will take you and fix you up and patch you up so i went into boot camp i was all busted up they put me in the, in the hospital in surgery they they did the surgery and uh, i had about 100 stitches in me and they gave me this big sea bag that i'm carrying with this that, that's just kind of the way the navy does the army has the right idea they take you and they, they say your job is to get well your, and, and so all the time, and you might be uh, in medical hold for two years if you're in the Army. But then the Navy, they said, okay, we passed you up, get on out there and go to work. You know, but, but consider that in the Navy, we come from a heritage of pirates and thugs. So, I mean, that's just, what, what do you expect? What do you want to know? But anyway, I thought about, uh, Jeff said, uh, must be a lower standard. And I thought about, we as Christians, and the fact that we are redeemed, the fact that none of us shows up worthy to be an ambassador for Christ. But God loved us so much that he gave us this opportunity. He took us just like the Navy took me and patched me up and then put me back on my way. And 31 years later, you know, I'm, you know, retired Navy. God saw us. All messed up. And he said, I'll take you anyway. I'll clean you up. 
He says, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. God is so gracious in spite of us. He'll take us and clean us up. And you know what? We can really do some good work. We can go out there and we can serve God. And each and every day that we live as a member of the family of God, of the body of Christ, we should be grateful that we're not out there in the darkness, that we aren't lost, that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. God loved us so much that he allowed Jesus to, set, to make a perfect sacrifice that we could get cleaned up. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hung on the tree. As was mentioned, uh, I don't know if it was mentioned this morning, you know, you have so many conversations with people, but the, the fact is that that crucifixion was not a glamorous event. It was ugly. Crucifixion is not for wimps. Crucifixion was a very, it was the most inhumane, cruel way that a person could die. But God allowed his son to do that for us. Shouldn't we be grateful? Shouldn't we be willing to go out and say, my God is great. I want to do something to serve him. And what he wants is for everybody to come to him. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Blessed be the, the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. So again, as a result of that, we want to go out and we want to do like God said. We want to make disciples of every nation. And as I was, uh, uh, last week I went to a preacher's meeting over uh, the University Park. They have them every month at the end of the, uh, the month. I go to the meetings because I got affiliated with them as I was doing my research because I had to go and talk to all the preachers and elders and, 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 and folks that are leaders in, in the churches to, to get permission to go in and do the survey. Some of you that are sitting here this morning were part of the, the research data that I collected and I will eternally be thankful to you. You will hear me say it over and over again because I, I'm grateful to you, not only because I was able to finish my program, but I actually was able to gather some good data about the body of Christ, the church of Christ, how we build trust, uh, how we have hope and faith and altruistic love with one another. And I'm, the hardest thing is to be able to share it with the people that I collected the data with. And that's, that's not uncommon. I find that as a consultant, a lot of times people, you know, kind of, you know, they don't want you to come in and, and show them the, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But sometimes you need to know that kind of stuff so you can, can clean yourself up, you know, so that you can correct those things, or that you can do better the stuff that you're doing good already in the first place. So, uh, but anyway, here's what I, uh, what, one of the people that always uh, uh, presents at the preacher's meeting is Brother Castile. Uh, Brother Castile, uh, uh, he lives up in Northern Virginia, but he's out of Tennessee a lot. Uh, how many of you have heard of the uh, Churches of Christ Disaster Relief? They are great ambassadors for Christ. They do some great and wonderful work. And, I, and he gives out this report every week. If I would advise you to go online and just put in Churches of Christ Disaster Relief effort. And it will tell you all the places where they, they've done disaster relief. If there's a tornado in Arkansas, Oklahoma, they send a big old, what these long vans that has everything in it that people need. Food, furniture, clothes, all that kind of stuff. And they show up at a congregation of the Church of Christ and, they, and the people that are there can appreciate the fact that we are providing those resources for them. Now, this congregation supports the, uh, the disaster relief effort. And in fact, at one time, they came up here. It's rare that they come up here, but they, they do go to a lot of places that are, that are damaged from tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, those kinds of things, characteristically in the United States. Uh, and actually, they say that they provide victims of major disasters in the U.S. with food, hygiene items, new clothing, and cleaning supplies paid for by the Church of Christ members. So that's, that's something that we can really be grateful to God for blessing us with the resources to support that. 
I think I, there's a whole list, and you can get the report online, but they, get, they paid out over $5 million last year in supporting various different places around the country. Now, again, what they'll do is they'll go to a church of Christ in that local area and say some, they, there's a tornado that touches down in Brinkley, Arkansas. They'll send a big old van there, and all those people in Brinkley, Arkansas will come to that church of Christ in that town. And while they're there, they administer to those people. They are ambassadors for Christ. They do some great outreach for them. And I'm sure that there have been many souls that have been saved as a result of that. The Churches of Christ disaster relief effort was there when no one else was available. They inspired everyone in the community to come together and to care for those in need. That was said by somebody that was in Jonesboro, Arkansas. So that's, that's something that we can be thankful that God has blessed us to be able to support. Uh, and, and we can do it individually. When I go to the Crusade for Christ, Brother Castile is usually there. He was at the last lectureship that was out in Beltway. Uh, and he, he'll take donations. Uh, in fact, uh, I, have, uh, I have a miniature of this truck that's at my house that I got from my son-in-law. I mean, not my son-in-law, my grandson. <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know, because I gave him a certain amount of money, they said, oh, okay, you can have one of these. And he just gave it to him. I didn't ask him for it, but, you know, that's, that's that. But anyway, if you want a truck for your grandkid or your kid, kid in your neighborhood or something, just give them a chunk of money and they'll hook you up. There's a lot of ways in which we can be ambassadors for Christ. This, you will recognize, is right here in this building. Uh, some of you recall there was a brother uh, named uh, Michael Collada. Michael Collada was in the convalescent home over here for years, for three years. I used to go over there and have a, he was one of the people that helped me to begin to uh, go through the Back to the Bible class. Now, uh, Alex Henry said, hey, he's going to be a Christian. That's fine. But you know, the word of God is the word of God. And sometimes, you know, I would go over there and make, I don't know how many other people would visit him, but we would go over there and we would go through each lesson and, uh, and I enjoy spending some time with him. Sometimes we would go over there on a Sunday and have communion with him. There's a congregation in, uh, up north of here, I can't think of the name of the town, but brother, uh, anyway, there's a congregation in the Church of Christ that's, that visits the same convalescent home, brother, Edo, Edo, Freeman, Freeman. Brother Freeman visits that same convalescent home probably once or twice a month, and they administer to those people over there. I really want to encourage us to be a part of that. Uh, those people, when we, when you show up to the convalescent home, again, sometimes we're the only somebody they see outside of the folks that they work with every day. And we sit and we sing songs, and Brother Filial is very good at leading songs, and Brother... Uh, Brother Crazy is there and with his family. Uh, they love to see children. So if you have, when, I, when my grandchildren are here, we usually like to take them with them. But back to Michael Collada. Michael Collada passed away uh, this past year. And this is where the, uh, the funeral was here. Uh, the person you see that uh, Brother uh, Pratt talking to is Michael Collada's uh, daughter. Uh, and we're in the process of really trying to stay in touch with her. I don't believe she's a member of the body of Christ. But uh, that's just another way in which we can reach out to people. Ann Kelly's funeral was here. Met a lot of her family. Uh, met a lot of people in her family that were members of the church and were not, and some that weren't members of the church. Some people only come back to the meet with the saints when there is a funeral. And so that's an opportunity where you can capitalize as an ambassador for Christ to make them realize that we are all fellow travelers to the grave. Amen. Ain't none of us getting out of here alive, okay? So uh, it's a good opportunity for us to minister to people uh, when you go to the funeral or, or when you go to weddings. That's not the same thing. <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, also here's another opportunity that, oh, this, I showed this this morning. Uh, this is, uh, these are little young ambassadors out there uh, in our parking lot when, the, uh, when we were feeding the home, I mean, not the homeless stuff, we were doing the food pantry, and they're out there doing some really good work. I, I'm just really proud of them. This is a, one of the actual preacher's meetings that I was talking about. 
And these brothers come together to encourage and edify one another, but that's an opportunity for them to uh, encourage and to teach and to learn and to share. I remember uh, back in the, the early 2000s, I was in South Africa, and some of the most invigorating and encouraging uh, ambassadorial work that I did was in South Africa with some other brothers in Christ from Georgia and other places. And we all, we would be up until like four in the morning sometimes just talking about some of the things in the family of God, how we can do things better, how we can encourage each other, how we can reach out to people and some of the things that we were doing. I told, I think I told them, I don't know if I told this group or the, the life group, uh, group that, uh, some days we, one day we baptize as many as 20 people. And that's the most people I've seen baptized at any one time. Uh, of course, on the day of Pentecost, it was a whole lot more than that. But we should strive, you know, we can, there are some congregations that strive to baptize somebody at least every month. They strive to do that every week. Why is that so important? Because that's, that's the most important thing that anybody's going to ever do while they're on this planet is to be added to the family of God before we depart this place. On the 26th, uh, Brother Sykes is supposed to be here. Uh, uh, Brother Sykes is the brother you hear me talk about all the time. He was supposed to send me some slides. I think he might have sent them already. Hopefully I'll, I'll be able to show them to you next week. Next week, I'm hoping that will be the Sunday that we will all be able to share our stories. Uh, so I'll slice out some time for us to sit down and just share it with somebody. This is why and I'm a member of the Church of Christ. That your testimony, just like Paul, Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, got knocked off his horse. He told his story several times. And your story might be different depending on who you're talking to. Or it might, you know, you might have a two-minute elevator story, or you might have one that lasts 20 minutes. The last time we did that. Uh, I didn't set it up right, and some people just went on and on and on and told their story, and the other person didn't get to share theirs. So we'll try to fix that next week. But hopefully, like I said, on the 26th, Brother uh, Sykes will be here, and he has some fascinating stories to share. He's a brother that's he's baptized about 50 people in the last three years, and he's works very hard uh, for the School of Evangelism. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll have an opportunity to meet him. Of course, uh, I have to mention the friends, family, and neighbors. If you haven't signed up for that, this is the last day to sign up here in the lobby. You can still go online. The QR code should be segregated in such a way you can click on it and tell us who you are and how many people you're bringing with you. Uh, we really want to get a good head count. Hopefully, we have an accurate enough count to where nobody goes away hungry. We want to make sure that we not only give them physical food, uh, but we also spend some time, uh, and that's why, kind of one of the reasons why I want to go over the sharing our stories next week, is because when, when the friends, family, and neighbors come here, this is a major relationship building exercise for us as a family. You know, when, when, when you're getting ready to have company and you tell your kids, you better be good. <laughs> you know, be on your best behavior. We're just going to be ourselves. And we want them to see how we love each other. We want them to see how wonderful it is to be an ambassador for Christ, to be a child of God. Also, a list will be coming out that will ask us to bring. Now, I think the food is going to be catered, but we are asking people to bring desserts. We're asking people to bring desserts, and I think that the salads are going to be provided too. But it should go really quickly. The sisters have really thought it out. God, God bless the sisters in the body of Christ. We'd be all messed up if there weren't sisters here. Uh, they have thought it all through, and I think that they have figured it out in such a way that you'll be able to come, and you get your meal, and you move on, and you don't have to stand there and go through a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to move through pretty quickly. The meals will be prepackaged for those of you who are concerned about, you know, COVID or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, we also need some service. So if you need, if you feel like you could be free that day, uh, some of the things will be served up. Uh, see Naomi, or see any of the sisters uh, that you know they're going to be a part of that. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so that ought to be a good time for us. I'm not really sure what we're going to do for the evening worship that day, but I think we'll find out before then. But, with, but it's important for us to realize that uh, we encourage you to bring your guests to the 10.30 a.m. service. If they come to the 8 o'clock service and they split up and they go or and they don't want to stay for Bible class, then we would have lost that opportunity. So for the opportunity for us to really have fellowship with them, to really get to know them, uh, and that day when we have those guests here, they should talk to no less than a dozen people here. Now, I know some people get kind of overwhelmed, if, and we'll have a class on that hopefully before they get here about how to, you know, to not overwhelm people. But anyway, friends and family, I talked about the door knocking campaign. That's, that's way up in September. We look forward to being able to do that. And we talked about how to keep our family intact and to be uh, retaining members. And we looked at how do we do that? And we determined that the more ways that we engage people, the better. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the health fair yesterday. Uh, people were really uh, encouraged by that. We were glad that I saw a lot of our sisters that are, were getting up. And in fact, this is it right here. You recognize anybody on that? You can see the back of her head. Right? <laughs> anyway, uh, it was really good to be there with the saints that were from congregations all over the area. And this was actually the, the event. They, they had a lot of really heavy hitter speakers. I, I got into the class that was the art therapy class and some other stuff. Oh, here it is. <laughs> got them, caught them. They were there at the, the fellowship. And as you can see, there's a whole lot of people there. Don't they look happy? <laughs> they were there happy uh, having that fellowship. A lot of people that weren't able to be there because they were here doing the food pantry. God bless you for those of you that were here, you know, holding up the fort and making things happen and bringing it together. Uh, Brother Bob is uh, uh, in, uh, the, the deacon in charge of that now. Uh, but we talked about all the different ways in which we can uh, reach people. We talked about the radio show. And this morning I mentioned in the sermon about the fact that everything that we do at some point should lead to bringing people to the body of Christ. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do this coming Saturday is a street street fair, street festival. Uh, like I said, there's sign-ups out there in the lobby. I don't know where they're on. What side are they on, please? I think they're on this side. Don't get confused with the sign-up for the, the 19 Friends and Family and the street festival. I think that there's a, a, there's, there's a need for a setup team, a teardown team. But you can, anybody can come throughout the day. If you can just come for one day and pass out flyers and just be there as a you know, member of the body, fellowship with those that are there, I think we're just going to put up one tent. Uh, so uh, let's take advantage of the opportunity that we have to be ambassadors. Uh, uh, there we go. Uh, we need a setup. That's going to start really early in the morning at like 530 or something like that. Okay, okay. So we probably need some people that you know, people that are that can get up in the morning. The hardest thing I do in the morning is get up. <laughs> so I'm not a morning person, but I could, you know, 30 some years in the Navy, it kind of force you to, you know, adapt to that and do it when you need to. We need some people that are going to be tearing down and then all day long just out there doing tracks. I think we're going to also be passing out water uh, so you can kind of be there to pass that out and stuff. This is something that's coming up uh, in June. Yeah, June the 8th. June the 8th. Uh, and I think everybody that's participating that has been assigned. Uh, you'll probably be seeing some more literature, some more information. Another opportunity to be ambassadors. So now, we're finally getting up to, to moving on through this lesson. Uh, and we talked about the things that we're looking at ways in which we can keep people in the family of God, in the body of Christ. 71% of the people who stayed felt that nobody came and manipulated them or bothered them or, or really tried to, to, you know, we can talk about this manipulation thing in a few minutes. 85% of the people who left or dropped out after six months felt as though they were manipulated. What do you think that means when it says manipulate? This is all from Flavel Yakeley's book on why they left. 
And the, the section where you talk about the people that stayed uh, or, or, you know, or left, the people that, who did stay, didn't feel as though somebody manipulated them. What do you think he means by being manipulated? Yes. Well, I think when you talk about manipulation, I think, um, you know, making people feel like guilty, like mm -hmm. um, you're going to go to hell if you don't mm -hmm. cub type thing. Um, I was, I've experienced that. Yes. Um, for some people that might work because fear works on some people, for, mm -hmm. but for a large majority of people, it turns them away. Yes. And so when you talk about being genuine, it's really like you care about them. You, Absolutely. you learn about them, mm -hmm. you show concern, not, um, you know, drive them to like, you know, Hey, you're going to go to hell. If you're not here, you yeah. gotta be real, uh, concerned for them. That's, that's, that's so essential. Uh, you've heard it said a lot of times people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Uh, we, we need to really be genuine and authentic and honest about how we care about the soul of every single individual that comes in to our uh, circle. Uh, I was talking to a brother yesterday when we went out to the health fair. He was brought into the, he was introduced to the Church of Christ through the Crossroads Movement. Have any of you heard about the Crossroads Movement? Crossroads Movement used a lot of manipulation. I had talked to some of the members of the Crossroads Movement when I was out in Poway, California. Those of you that are familiar with uh, the Crossroads Movement know about Poway. Uh, I, I met a brother out in uh, Newport, Rhode Island that I knew pretty well, ran into him again in the military. You run into people all over the place that you met over in this part of the world, and you run into him again, that kind of stuff. I, said, I saw this brother, I was at the exchange or something, and he said, hey, why don't you come to worship with me? I said, yeah, great. Went to, uh, went to a Friday evening Soul talk. Anybody heard that term before? Went to Friday evening and soul talk. And they seemed so excited, so thrilled, so exuberant. And I said, oh, this, you know, this is the way we ought to be. It looked really good. And then the next day I stayed at his house. The next day a, a guy came over and he said, come on, we're getting ready to go do something. He said, well, I had something else planned. He said, cancel it. We're going to do this. What do you mean? One of the things that they, that they did in that movement is they found out really personal information on people. And then, you know, if you decided that you didn't want to do something, they say, well, we're going to go knock doors today. And they said, no, I had planned to go see my sister. I planned to go to the hospital. I planned to go to the movie. They said, well, you know, uh, you wouldn't want anybody to find out about such and such. Personal stuff. So, so that's why it's a really good thing that that movement is gone. Now, we act like we're surprised that something like that would happen in the family of God. There's been all kind of stuff that's happened in the family of God. Judas betrayed Christ. I mean, and so we just need to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We need to be able to discern the truth. We need to determine whether or not somebody is, is really trying to to run a number on us. So I'm going to hit this real quick. This is Troy. I, I'm a thrifter. Okay, I like to go to thrift stores. And I was in the thrift store, and this guy walks up on me, and he says, I want to ask you a question. I said, what is that? He said, do you love God? I said, of course I love God. And we just kind of got into the conversation, and we start talking and talking, and then he pulls out these watchtowers. Okay, so I knew who he was. Um, and I, I don't know how he picked me out of the group. I don't know. Maybe it was, I don't know. But anyway, I, I kind of figured, I, I had the conversation with him, you know. I wasn't rude to him or anything. But I said, look, Troy, I, I, I really got to go someplace. Give me your number. And I didn't have, at the time, I didn't have any of these with me. I hope all of y'all pick some of these up, right? These are my new business cards. I gave some out yesterday. Uh, so, you know, if I... If somebody says, do you have a business card? Oh, I ran out of business card, but let me give you this. And I just write my number on here. Now, again, there's one version that has Ricky's number on here. So <laughs> if you want to 
you know, kind of defer that and not talk to the preacher instead of, you know, calling you person. Or you can put both numbers on there. I, I used one of the ones that had Ricky's number on it, and I wrote my number on it and my name and gave it to somebody. But anyway, uh, when I found out uh, that he was a, you know, Jehovah Witness, I took his number. I said, I'll call you back. And I really did call him back. And I got a, a one of those voice things that says, this number cannot be serviced or something like that. So I never really got a chance to talk to Troy. Uh, but anyway, uh, if any of you have ever studied with or dealt with or had an interaction with Jehovah's Witness, they, they, it, they are relentless. I mean, you see them out knocking on the door. They're doing what we should be doing because we got the truth. Uh, but, but a lot of them are, you know, I, I, I had an experience with them. We were in Seattle, Washington, and we were studying with, we were studying with a couple uh, that, that weren't Christians. The good news is the family, they are now Christians. Uh, but when we were studying with them, uh, they set it up. They said, why don't you meet us next Saturday at this time? Oh, oh OK. Well, what we didn't know is they had also been studying with the JWs, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, who said, oh, you, you met the Church of Christ people? Why don't you have them come back at this time? And so while we were sitting there having a Bible study with them, here come the Jehovah's Witnesses. Boom, they bushwhacked us. <laughs> they popped in on us while we were having our Bible study with them. You know, I think we were using open Bible study or, or something like that. But nevertheless, that felt to me like manipulation. You know, that felt like they were kind of like trying to set us up instead of being genuine and open and honest. So again, uh, uh, like our sister said, you should be genuine. You should be for real. You should be honest, not necessarily a salesperson. Just get them to, to see who you are as a child of God. That's your greatest message right there. And don't come across as when I say not Jersey, I don't mean to get, offend anybody that's from New Jersey or from New York. My son is lives in New Jersey and he's cynical about everybody. <laughs> he approaches a lot of people like they're going to try to put their hand in your pocket, right? And so he's just kind of like, you know, because a lot of times people can be kind of crafty and so forth. So, you know, it's, it's not one of those things where like, you do genuinely want to, at some point, get a non-Christian to sit down and have a Bible study. But just like Rob Whitaker talks about, first of all, just get to know them. Just get, get them to realize that you care about them as a person. You care about their soul. Uh, and you show that love. And they can tell. So we as Christians just need to let them see Jesus in us. Meet them where they are. You know the woman at the well? You know, Jesus met her where she was. And she said, well, you know, I don't have a husband. He said, yeah, that's right. You had a whole bunch of husbands before. You got one, you know, that, that you're living with now. It ain't your husband. Just meet them where, where they are and, and love them, you know, uh, and, and not throw stones at them. Uh, help them to adapt uh, to congregational norms. When people come to the body of Christ, sometimes there's some adjustments they need to make. Uh, and they need to get adapted to. Back when I became a Christian, everybody showed up at worship service with a Bible. And that was kind of one of the things that, you know, you expected. Uh, now, you know, the Bible's here in the pews. You know, you can find them. Uh, it depends on the congregation that you go to. Uh, if you go to Jamaica, they expect you to show up with your Bible and your own songbook. So... So it's, you know, you adapt, adapt to the, the, the congregational norms. Share, share positive aspects of the family. Don't put all the dirty laundry out there about the family if we're having some drama, because we are a family and we go through some stuff. And sometimes we disagree with each other. Sometimes we don't treat each other right, but we, we are always working on trying to be better about that, amen? And so when people show up, you... We want them to, to realize that, that we most, foremost, we care about them and that we want to, uh, to lead them to Christ. I told you about Troy. Develop new friendships prior to conversion. 
this is where um, friends and family and neighbors, we're going to bring them in and let them meet us. Let them get acquainted with us. We don't have to wait for that day. I mean, it's, it, it, whenever you can introduce a non-Christian to a Christian, that's a plus. It should be a plus. So if you can uh, look at some of the things that are, how many of you read How to Win Friends and Influence People? It's a Dr. Dale Carnegie book. When my kids were growing up, I told them, I said, I'll pay you $10 per chapter to read this. Couldn't get them to do it. <laughs> Couldn't get them. And it's some real good stuff in there. It's just some chapter just say, smile. <laughs> just smile at people. There's something about when you smile at somebody, a lot of times they'll smile back, depending on what they're going through. But anyway, uh, I try to get my kids to read How to Win Friends and Influence People, and they weren't interested. But when they got into business, when they got into, uh, one, my son was a, a product marketing, internet market, product marketing, internet marketing executive. And what do you think was the first thing they told him to do? Go read How to Win Friends and Influence People. And, and he was paying them money to do it. And I would have paid him. Again, just sometimes just be pleasant, smile. If you can remember people's names, this is something I have a real hard time with, but there's techniques that you can use to remember people's names. You know how it feels when somebody remembers your name? I, I remember when I was in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, I was in school, I was doing a, re uh, a residency, and I went to this church, uh-oh, it's buzzing. Is that you, Joe? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, five minutes, five minute countdown. <laughs> I think it's a good story. I was in Bloomington, Indiana. One day I got an opportunity to go to three different congregations, but the congregation I went to that morning, uh, I got there and all the elders were lined up in the front, you know, in the lobby. And as I came in, they were, you know, shaking each one of the elders' hands. I don't know, that's, okay, that's kind of nice. Went in, sat down, had a great worship service, went back to my, my the, the campus where I was during my residency, and I wanted to come back for eating and worship. Well, I came back at the time that I thought it was, and I was pulling into the parking lot. The parking lot was at the back of the building. So you pull into the front, you go down this long lane, and as I was pulling towards the parking lot, I saw this guy running. I mean, he, would, he wasn't really running, but he was walking at a very brisk pace to get up to the building. I said, oh, man, I must be late. He wasn't, I wasn't late. He was just anxious to get there. He was just anxious to be with the saints. I thought, wow, that's pretty nice. And so I parked my car, went around, came through the front door, and guess what? All the elders are still standing there. I mean, they have not been there all day. I don't think. But they were standing there, and as I walked in the door, the first elder said, hey, Carl, how you doing? I said, whoa. You know, he, you know, I visited there once. And this guy said, hey, Carl, welcome back. How you doing? Glad to have you for worship service. I thought, whew, that's pretty amazing. Every time I went back to Bloomington, guess where I went to worship service? There. So if you can figure out one of those little tricks as to how to remember people's names, uh, because people's name is one of the most wonderful sounds to them in the world. Talk in terms of what people will understand and what they're interested in and sincerely make the other person feel really important. I mean, not just for faith, not manipulation, but really make them feel important. Tell yourself this is a precious soul that God wants in the family of God, and he's using me as an ambassador to reach this person. This is an opportunity. And so finally, the more friends a person develops in the church before they get converted, the more likely they are to remain in the church after conversion. Let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, God, for this privilege to continue to look at ways in which we can be better ambassadors. As we look forward to the opportunity to welcome visitors 
and friends and family, we pray that we will arm ourselves with the whole armor of God and that they will see the best of what you and your children have to offer that will lead people to render obedience unto your word. Bless everybody here. Help us to realize how fortunate we are, how blessed we are to be right here, right now, in the church of Christ. Forgive us of our sins and help us to let our light shine in such a way that brings you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, this is Ricky Cook, one of the ministers here at the Laurel Church of Christ. We're glad you've chosen to watch our video broadcast. We'd also like to invite you to join us for in-person worship. We have worship services at 8 a.m. and another at 1030 a.m. every Sunday morning. We also have a worship service in Spanish at 1 p.m. Sunday afternoons. Bible class is on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have Bible class in both English and Spanish. Please know that you're always welcome here. We look forward to seeing you.